Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the noon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I am joined by one co host, Ricardo Martinez, today, as Jerry has no internet connection. Uh, and today we are interviewing uh, Hayley Lennon, uh, someone who's done a shit ton of stuff, such as being a member of the Regulatory Council of Coinbase, Bitflyer, Silvergate Bank, uh, a founder of Crypto Connect, uh, contributor for Forbes, and a partner for Anderson Kill Law. Uh, and this is just the things on uh, her Twitter bio. So uh, there's a lot more to it. Uh, now, the first question I've got for you today, uh, we are known here at the moon for our hard hitting journalism. Uh, All right. I'm ready. <laughs> so you carried out a clubhouse debate back in uh, early 2021, which I think everyone really wants to know the outcome of the, the true answer. And that is, is cheese a condiment? <laughs> I was like, is he going to bring up the cheese? Um, that was actually my first club, maybe my first and only clubhouse um, participation. My uh, law partner, Stephen Pally, likes to debate about food. And um, so I don't think cheese is a condiment. You can dip things in it, but um, it can also be the main star of a dish like a grilled cheese or something. So I took, I took the, the argument that it's not a condiment. Okay, you'll be I happy like to know that you've chosen correctly, and we can continue this interview. Yes, no, yeah, we were, that turned into a crazy debate. And the weirdest thing is that, um, halfway through, my next door neighbor joined, and he, I didn't, he's not even really in the crypto space. And I was like, What, Connor, what are you doing in this chat about cheese? It was just a really small world, um, moment. Yeah, I remember the um, the early clubhouse days. Yeah. It was very fun. I found that like my my uh, cousin turned up randomly uh, in a Bitcoin chat, like a really like meme Bitcoin chat thing yeah. with like ten people. <laughs> it's yeah. just the weirdest, the weirdest like groups of people just appear. Like people from my childhood just rock up in like a Dogecoin shit chat or something. Because I yeah. ended up being in. Um, hey so guys, I quite liked that. Like, yeah. <laughs> it was well, good fun. Yeah, okay. started a conversation, especially with COVID. I think that those like chat groups. Um, were probably more popular than they would have been because we were all at home just craving, you know, interaction with other people. Exactly. It was like a social uh, interaction replacement. I um, Okay, no, so that's fine. I Just to close off, so Ricardo's with you. I feel like it's, it's actually, it can be both, um, which is fine. I think you it's a very to. flexible... <laughs> do you, why do you have... To, it's a very flexible food, right? So if it's nacho cheese, as, as Ricardo pointed out to me, that's condimenty, condiment-esque. I mean, you're mm -hmm. kind of pouring it. And then if you've got like a camembert and you're dipping, that could be like kind of like a condiment. But otherwise, I'm feeling like most of the time, cheese is not a condiment, uh, in you're, my opinion. You're misrepresenting my argument because I said that nacho cheese is not actual cheese. That's why it's a condiment. Oh. Okay. Right. And I Fair would enough. say that nacho cheese is a main ingredient or you won't even have the nachos. So once again, not a condiment. Ketchup, okay, right. on the other hand, you would never eat like a ketchup sandwich. But yeah, we, we had an hour long debate in that chat. So we could spend the whole time talking about that. Yeah, which I, we won't do that for the sake of people <laughs> listening. Um, I promise we'll move on. We should have had you in our debate team, though, because I just got, you know, uh, I just got schooled there. So uh, first question outside of our hard hitting journalistic insights uh, would be, well, I guess this is a good place to start is could you just give us like a summary talk through your journey? Like, how did you end up getting involved with crypto? in the yeah. first place and like how did that happen like you know who, who are you who is Haley? well how did yeah. it all start it's actually a really interesting story and i don't go all the way back to the beginning often but um i was a, a first year attorney at a law firm and really didn't like it i was just doing like commercial litigation nothing about finance or crypto or anything like that and then after my first year i was like i'm gonna go in-house i want to work at an in-house you know company and that's really hard to do when you're early in your legal career because no one wants a second year attorney as their in-house counsel. You don't know what you're doing really. Um, but I found this little company. I went to law school in San Diego and there was this company in San Diego called DollarX. And what they were doing was wholesale currency exchange. So like dollars to pesos along the Mexico border, I like had the armored trucks and everything. And so I joined just to be general counsel, but I immediately was like, in the chief compliance officer's ear. Like, what's anti-money laundering? What are you doing? Like, what is the risk here? Um, and I kind of went down 
first I went down sort of the financial crime rabbit hole, like understanding um, money laundering and terrorist financing and those sort of things. Um, and then at the same time, my boyfriend at the time was talking my ear off about Bitcoin. It was 2013, 2014. And I was sort of like, I don't, I think for some people, it takes a little bit of time to really get it. So if, at first I was like, mm, like, I don't really understand, but he started buying it and I started being more curious. And then Silvergate Bank popped up on my radar and reached out to me. Um, and they said, we're a, you know, a local bank here in town and we really want to bank cryptocurrency companies in the space. Um, and what you're doing at DollarX, like understanding the money laundering risks and the licensing requirements for wholesale um, currency exchange is actually really similar to some of the legal and regulatory issues that Coinbase and you know, Gemini's of the world are experiencing and what we need to understand before we can bank these companies. So then I joined Silvergate and I was just like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is the coolest industry ever. Um, you know, really started to meet some of like the big players in the space early on. And I was hooked. I was like, okay, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. <laughs> You've done something. You've done something. You did something that I always tell people, I like friends or whatever, uh, is basically to just follow what you find interesting, and what yeah. you like, and then yeah. stuff just seems to work out fine by chance. Um, yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, I could have. Um, I did. I totally took a risk, like not doing the traditional. You know, as an attorney, many um, partners now would have spent you know ten years at a law firm as an associate, um, really grinding away. And maybe not doing what they were passionate about, but I think because I took a chance and a risk and like pivoted um, and found this area that I was so interested in, I've just been able to like, um, you know, like see my career really flourish because it's like, it doesn't feel like work. Um, so it's, that's pretty cool. All right, it's, it's, uh, it's awesome. It's awesome to see, actually. I like that. Um, yeah. I suppose uh, one of the things that you're doing currently is uh, so I'm, I'm jumping a little bit forward um, usually i like to kind of go forward in time but uh yeah. this kind of interests me and and uh, is crypto connect yeah uh, that's uh, one of the things you're working on so with that it's probably a good idea to explain to people what it is uh which it should be hopefully simple um yeah. and then where did this idea come from and like yeah. what's it been like for you to do that because it's quite a big thing to try and build communities so like how's yeah. how's it going how's the experience been yeah, I mean, in some ways, I think I bit off more than I can chew. I mean, you were listing some of the things I'm involved in right now, and I'm a partner at Anderson Kill, and I write part time for Forbes. And um, but all of last year, once I joined as Anderson Kill as a partner, I was traveling around a lot for meetings and like business development. And I think COVID sort of changed how people live. You know, like people have turned sort of nomadic or they're moving around more often, or they're just relocating from some of these like major cities like New York and San Francisco. And so what Crypto Connect is, um, is it's trying to create like a decentralized community, but under one umbrella so that no matter where you are or traveling for work or moving, um, you can ping into communities. So um, we launched in 12 different cities in the United States, and we're actually adding eight more um, in the next month or so, and hope to go international eventually, but it's just have to take it kind of slow at first. Um, but so the idea is like we launched in these 12 major cities, and members can sign up through CryptoConnect.org and sort of choose what chapter they want to be affiliated with. But the goal is for people to be able to ping into those other um, chapters when they travel and, and move and things like that. And so the idea really came because I myself was traveling a lot last year for work. Um, and I was almost having to use my like Twitter um, platform to say, hey, I'm going to be in Nashville this week. Who's there? For one, that doesn't feel great for like security or like privacy <laughs> to like have to announce. Um, your travel plans but I also just like I was really having to like lean on Twitter to say what companies are here like who want who would be up to meet for a beer um, what meetups are good here um, and 
and like meetup.com and all these crypto meetups that already exist are great, but there's not like a centralized way to already know about those things. So I started talking to, you know, contacts in the industry and I was just like, this is frustrating, like that there's not sort of, um, bef you know, before I went into crypto, I was a, I was on the board of the um, ACAMS, which is a, the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists, but they have chapters all over the world. Um, and it's kind of easy to ping into like the legitimate companies and projects that want to, you know, do um, meetups or anything like that. So that's sort of where the idea came from. And uh, I never thought I'd be like the founder of anything. I, I'd not I think I have a pretty good risk tolerance for like career moves, but I never thought I'd like found an organization, but it just, as I started having conversations with more people in the space, it kind of organically grew. Um, and what was also exciting is that our board, you know, is all women led. And so that's sort of another topic, but just like having a women led organization, um, even though all of our events are co-ed and open to everyone, I think that that's kind of important to see like female leadership in this space because sometimes you don't see much of that. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I won't ask you to reach out to me if you move to London to 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 fire up because. <laughs> no, we actually some of the chapters we're adding uh, this month will be male led. So our, ah, our okay. you know, what, yeah. So I, I'd love your involvement. Honestly, um, we had like the board, you know, just sort of like in a way almost happened to be women because I was just sharing my experience with friends that I've had in the industry for years. And they were like, I'd love to be involved. I'd love to be involved. Oh, I know this other person that should be involved. Um, but the idea is really not, you know, we didn't call it like women in Bitcoin. The idea is not to be like, to really right. for gender, you know, like I don't want gender to be the point of discussion or even like more divisive. The idea is just like, Hey, everyone's welcome. And um, women, if you're interested in the space, know that there's other like mind, like like minded or people that look like you come on. But um, but I think it's super important for it to be like um, not not about gender. You know what I mean? Like really like Bitcoins for everyone. And so so is this organization. So I would, gotcha. I would love to have your involvement, honestly. Absolutely. Well, I say we've, we've hosted things in the London before as part of it refill. So I can always help out, I'm sure. But it's awesome. nice. It's interesting to know it just it happened to go that way. And yeah. um, it's, it's kind of a cool thing to do. As you say, you, you didn't expect to be starting up an organization. And then if you look at your uh, work you've done over the years, you think it'd be some kind of legal based thing. But actually, it's like something totally yeah. different. And it's like a community based thing, which is really uh, like yeah. positive. And I, I like that kind of reminds me of like maybe like the Rotary Club or even like a less yeah. secretive Masons, I guess, because like wherever yeah. you go, you've got someone that you can uh, yeah, talk to. Like, I mean, I think I found that when I travel, like even for fun, if I can have like, if I can attend one Bitcoin meetup and just like see what the vibe is in that city, like it's just, it's just nice to ping into that. And um, I mean, I think for me, like I'm probably half like legal focused in my career, but the other half is about making those connections um, and sort of getting to know everyone in the space. So it, it kind of overlaps well with my you know my general sort of character and what i like to do i just love getting to know new people and having conversations about bitcoin um coming from your background in, in anti-terrorism and money laundering stuff and, and yeah. compliance um what's your take on what's going on with these donations to to the protesters up in canada and the financial censorship and how they've had to basically rely on bitcoin yeah it's pretty crazy i mean so i have i think my career has led me led me to have a very interesting balance and perspective. Um, I mean, one of the things I love about Bitcoin is that it challenges the status quo of like banks controlling your money, governments being able to surveil everything. Um, but I also understand the need for some regulation. Um, I, I mean, I think what we're seeing in Canada is really a good example. I mean, it's a, per, a really good advertisement for Bitcoin. Um, I mean, I've seen also the news that they're trying to like, um, you know, get sort of track or, or um, take funds from, from Bitcoin, you know, from people holding Bitcoin. And, you know, that's another like stress um, thing that stresses the importance of self custody. Um, but yes, I, I mean, I think what we've seen over sort of the last like five years, I think I tweeted a few weeks ago, like 
all these current events are perfect advertisements for Bitcoin because like a lot of the stuff making sense and or ha happening in the world right now like doesn't really make sense you're kind of like hey like that's people's money like you should be able to donate to a cause there should be able to be like peaceful protests I mean the whole thing seems really crazy to me um and yeah I mean I, I but I, and I've seen just so much um sort of Twitter activity about people saying get your crypto off the exchanges you know I think people in the US and other countries are kind of taking note of what's happening. Heard that different countries uh, in the past have had, you know, money seizures and all sorts of horrible protests, but never usually, uh, you wouldn't think it'd be US, Canada, anywhere, yeah. like, anywhere like that, right? But then, uh, you know, Canada, like probably one of the last estimates or guesses I would have had for for being in this situation. Me too, and, and, yeah. And, and now you look at it and you, and you see as well that beyond the stuff going on in the streets, there's now... I think it's the, I saw this in the news uh, this morning that they're investigating uh, Kraken and, and Coinbase uh, for encouraging self custody. I think the CEO is for tweeting out encouraging self custody, which I've seen that uh, too. I mean, yeah. the idea that, that information should be censored, you know, or like that, that uh, technology and innovation shouldn't be like, shared and explained to people is just insane. I mean, I understand it. We we see examples of that in the US too with um you know, regulators always are cr coming up with new things to point to. Oh, Bitcoin's used for money laundering. Oh, Bitcoin can be hacked. Oh, Bitcoin's bad for the environment. Like there's always these sort of arguments of why the technology shouldn't be able to be used as freely as it's intended to, but I think all of that just goes to show that it's sort of a threat. Like I think government and regulators oftentimes see it as a threat to some of the control that they have. That's very true. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it's very Orwellian, really. The the idea that oh, you're sharing information. That's you know, it's very, that, that to me is very Orwellian. But yeah. um, I mean, it's all it's all pretty alarming. I mean, I, I I'm an attorney. I I try to stay. I try to base all my opinions and emotions on facts. Like when it comes to a professional thing like this, um, I'm not one to like promote sort of, uh, um, you know, like fear narratives or like make things, you know what I mean? Like really yeah. come in, into like pretending like there's some bigger plot at play, but it is, it is weird to see it so close to home. Um, and I, I do think it's a good lesson. I mean, I don't, I don't think, um, I think I'd be feeling very different about the state of the world today if I didn't myself hold Bitcoin, which is a weird feeling because I think there's a lot of people that just don't understand it. Um, but I think, I think when people do, it becomes very clear that it's sort of a hedge against all of this stuff. I mean, we talk about a hedge against inflation. Sure. I mean, we're seeing a ton of money printing and inflation right now, but it's a hedge against sort of any, um, attempts to sort of take personal freedoms away yeah I, I, well, I suppose one thing as well though that it's it brought about is um there's been lots of times in the past where we've had fund like raising of bitcoin like fundraising bitcoin whether it be bitcoin beach in el salvador or, or right. there's, there's probably there's quite a few other examples i can't think of right now but with this situation it's kind of the first time i can think of at least especially in a in a, in a sort of a western state uh, or country that that you've got a a protest or something like that that's been there's been a big bitcoin fundraising and it's gone to like uh essentially two or three central people who then have to distribute the funds mm -hmm. and then it becomes the question of like how do you get that out of how do you get that out to the people who need it how do you then who don't understand it either right how yeah. do you then get them to spend it like whether it's through using you know uh bitcoin atms or other services uh, yeah. So, I, and, and it recently seems like it's gone a little bit tits up, to be honest. I was looking at Twitter uh, today and, it, and it's all a little bit shaky. Like, I think uh, it's down to one guy who then they were giving out paper wallets, but then they were getting seized by police or something. And yeah. so it's all a little bit, gone a little bit rough, but yeah. it could have gone a lot worse, I suppose, based upon the fact yeah. that this is the first time we've done this. But it, it is quite a new thing. And this feels like what Bitcoin was invented for. This feels like mm -hmm. really the first time I've seen it really go, okay, this is like, this is it. You know, this is kind of the real truest use case for this. Um, yeah, really. sometimes, sometimes it almost feels like whoever Satoshi Nakamoto was, like, in a in a way, saw where we were heading before most people did. I mean, I think 
um, certainly like, and part, part of it's age, but when I like graduated law school, I was not thinking about monetary policy or how to hedge against some of these risks. Um, but once you get that answer, you're like, oh, that is something that need, needed an answer for and something that is expanding. And it, yeah, I think, I mean, Bitcoin and the use of it always has growing pains. You know, there's like, um, it's such a new technology and there's a learning curve for how to use it safely. And so you hear the stories of the guy who lost his hard drive in the dump in some city and every year he's pay, trying to pay more money to get that out. And people like people who aren't in the space bring that up to me a lot. And I'm like, okay, well, that wouldn't happen to you because there's a few st steps to protect something like that happening. Um, and you'd be more knowledgeable, but you know, there's just like a learning curve to it. So even um, any of the issues we're sort of starting to see in Canada, like, yeah, I, I wouldn't, it's difficult initially to like start a new um, like ecosystem or community with Bitcoin and be able to educate people fast enough to kind of like get it off the ground. And that, especially when it's like dealing with a state of emergency. Okay.